remind yourself you have the tools to deal with tough conversations when they come up. Community is how you're able to get through it. And you really never know where your blessing or your help can come from unless you open up and share what you're going through. From To Be Magnetic, this is The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. And your host, Jessica Gill. As the leading destination for neural manifestation, we dispel the woo-woo in order to help you create real, tangible results based on neuroplasticity, psychology, epigenetics, and energetics. Our goal is to normalize the practice of manifestation and empower you to get into the driver's seat of your life in order to manifest the experiences, relationships, and things that most align with your authenticity. And by pressing play, the process begins. Welcome back everyone to another episode of Expanded, Jessica here. So we are at the end of our summer challenge. I can't believe it's been the five weeks already. It is so crazy to see. I know some of you are just starting. Do not worry. The challenge will remain open for the rest of the season. It'll be open until Labor Day. And you heard last week my sort of take and breakdown and experience through the challenge. But what I'm doing next and kind of how I'm navigating is continuing a process, continuing to integrate. I'm making sure to pick up at least 30 DIs per week and really sit with that, connect in what I'm needing. Is there more reinforcing that needs to be done? Do I want to connect with my inner child a bit more? Really taking an intuitive approach to the rest of the season, the summer season here in the Northern Hemisphere, and just giving myself exactly what my intuition is calling for. So I invite you guys to do the same and nurture yourself where is need be. There are six months left in the year 2024. And I really feel like taking this time to integrate all of this deep inner work, the belief systems, the things holding us back, the things that we want to tap into more joy in our life with, are really going to set us up for manifesting the best rest of 2024 that there is out there. We have our summer sale going on right now where you can join our membership, access our challenge, access our winter challenge that will be coming up in December, our big manifestation challenge, and spend a year with us and get $96 off our membership. That sale is ending on July 16th at midnight. So be sure to lock in the lowest rates of the season. On today's episode, I'm so excited for this incredible guest, Yasmin Cheyenne. Yasmin Cheyenne is a self-healing educator, a wellness expert, and author. And she just launched her latest book, Wisdom of the Path, the beautiful and bumpy ride of healing and trusting your inner guide. I love Yasmin because of her interesting and profound takes on the healing journey. And one thing we talk about a lot today and what she really talks about in the book is how life is this sort of roller coaster of sorts where we have these ups and downs. And when we can reflect on those moments that were difficult or hard or bumpy or that rock bottom moment or the rut moment or that challenging experience we went through, it allows us to increase our capacity for the joyful ones as well. And how can we start to integrate more joy and resilience and happiness in our day to day? We're going to have an episode coming up in the next few weeks around the energetics of this time of season. And so how can we start to play with that now? How can we start to integrate more joy, moments of joy in the day to day? How can we start trusting ourselves, stepping through fears? We're going to chat on all of this today. I know you guys are going to love this episode and definitely go check out her book, Wisdom of the Path. And now a word from our partners. Are you looking for a high quality, clean toothpaste that's sustainable, free of plastic, and actually works? Check out Bite Toothpaste Bits. They are my absolute favorite toothpaste that I've been using for years. 
They come in a glass jar that lasts four months and you get a little refillable package if you do the subscription model every month to refill it. So that means it's completely sustainable. You're not throwing out a little tube of plastic toothpaste every single month. In fact, the founder built the company based on the fact that she was seeing so much plastic in the ocean when she went out surfing. As she was on this journey for cleaner ways to do toothpaste in a more sustainable method, she found that when you remove the water from toothpaste, not making it paste, but making it a tiny pressed bit, you're able to remove so many of the harsh chemicals that are in most of the toothpaste on the market. No palm oil, SLS, artificial flavor, sulfates, parabens, microplastics, artificial preservatives, sweeteners, dyes, all the things that we don't want in anything we're ingesting or having touch our microbiome. The other thing I absolutely love about Bite is that their fluoride-free version has nanohydroxypate. This is a natural alternative to fluoride. So if you are someone who is really mindful about cavities or prone to cavities, but you don't want to use fluoride, this is going to be your new best friend. Nanohydroxypate is the same material that tooth enamel, dentine, and bones are primarily made of, which means it is biocompatible with your teeth. It helps to remineralize your teeth and effectively reduce tooth decay. It also helps tooth sensitivity and periodontal health. And even though I haven't been the greatest about going to get my teeth cleanings, I have had a clean bill of teeth health with no cavities to be seen. The other thing I really love about Bite is because you're not bringing a tube of toothpaste, you don't have to worry about traveling. You can just throw it in your bag, travel easily, get through security, put it in your check luggage. You don't have to worry about buying a travel size item. You can just take it with you on the go with ease. So if you are interested in trying out Bite's toothpaste bits, you can use the code MAGNETIC, all caps, M-A-G-N-E-T-I-C, for 20% off your first order. Again, that is code MAGNETIC, M-A-G-N-E-T-I-C, for 20% off. You can go to trybite.com slash magnetic or check the link in our show notes. All right, on to the episode. So excited today because we have Yasmin Cheyenne on, author, educator, really just leader in, I would say, attuning back to yourself. I love how you say like you're a self-healer advocate, like a self-healer guider. And it really is a connection, especially through your words, through your teachings, through everything that you share on your podcast. It's so incredible. I've been following you for years. I'm so excited to have you on. I am so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So one question we like to kick off with everyone. One is a fun one. One gets a little more deep. Do you happen to know your sun, moon, and rising sign? Of course. Okay, so (laughs) sun, Aries, moon, Taurus, rising, Cancer. I feel like I got the balance going with the fire, water, earth. Yes. And having, especially now in the Taurus season, grounding into everything, utilizing the earth and pleasures of earth to come back down. Yeah. I will say going through basically airy season, Taurus season, Gemini season, and then cancer season is a bit much Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> with them all having heavy placements, but yes. <laughs> I agree. I feel like the astrology this year in general has been a bit much, but <laughs> it's been a lot. Yeah. Yes. I'm like, where's the ease? Let's like go back into a little more lightness. Yes. I'm here for it. And our second question, what is your cultural background and upbringing and how did that inform who you are today? Yeah. I mean, I think when people ask me my cultural background, I feel like it's New Yorker. <laughs> oh, that's so American. <laughs> I'm a Brooklynite and I feel like it's so much a part of my upbringing my identity and not in in terms of how I identify, but it it was the foundation of how I saw the world. I'm glad that I got to see more than just New York now, but definitely New Yorker. (laughs) What lessons can you take from that that you're so grateful for? I think the number one thing, there's not a lot that can shock me. Knock on wood, universe, please don't. But (laughs) I think being exposed to so much so early and then having to to be taught how to deal with seeing things that I think normal people don't see on a regular basis unless you're in New York City, I think it also gave me a lot of compassion and empathy. You see a lot of hard stuff and, and you ask questions as a kid and you understand that 
the world is not the same for everyone. I, I love having that experience. I think it was definitely something that helped me in the work I do, do today. Do you feel like, I always wonder this about kids growing up in New York. Do you feel like you still had a neighborhood community? I know this is something you talk about in the book too. And do you still feel connected to that community? Because I remember I lived in New York for maybe like four years. And the community was everyone who I knew who had moved to New York or my coworkers. But there wasn't that like, I know my neighbor in the hallway or I know that person down the street. And maybe it's just because the timing that I was there in young 20s. Maybe now I would know my neighbor. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious your experience with that. I think definitely. I knew my neighbors above me, below me, on my floor. When I lived in Queens, I went to the supermarket and I would see people all the time that I knew in the supermarket. I knew the people that worked at the supermarket. I knew the crossing guard. I think New York is very heavily embedded in neighborhoods and where you're from and everyone knows everyone that lives in the area. So absolutely. I think for New York transplants, I think it's a little different. I've learned just from friends of mine that live there. You kind of have to start from scratch, I think. And it's it's tough doing that. Let's kind of dive into it in the community sense. You talk a lot about this in your book and this idea of how do we inventory our friends as we evolve, as we heal, as we're going through things? How do we take that moment of pause and be like, wait a second, is this even nourishing me? This person has been around forever, but do I feel good around them? Is my nervous system calm around them? Like, how do you take that inventory? And then one question we get asked a lot is like, how do I make friends as adults. You know, you're not in school, you're not in classes, you don't have summer break where you have endless free time. Everyone feels crammed for time, period. So how do you find that time to build that community? I'll start with the second question first. Personally, just to answer, I have met so many amazing people on social media. I slide into DMs, I'm talking specifically about friends. (laughs) I slide into DMs all the time and I'm like, I think you're awesome. I'm going to be in your city. Can we have coffee? Can we have lunch? And I just think it's a fun way to connect with people that you wouldn't normally meet. I also travel a lot. So I'm of the thought process. I love to have people that I can connect with in every city I go to. I have friends that I see when I go overseas. And so I think really recognizing that it is a lot tougher to make connections when you're older, you're not going to have those built-in people just being thrown into you at school or in college or at your job. A lot of us are probably at a place at work where we're working at the same place for a long time. So there's not even the the exchange of of coworkers shifting. And a lot of us are at, at home. We're not even working in an office. We're working from home. So don't be afraid to connect with somebody that you see online. The second thing that I think is really great with making friends is going to workshops in your neighborhood or things that you like. So if you like pottery, go into a pottery workshop. If you like yoga, go into a yoga workshop. I think workshop over class, because if you go to a yoga class, then it's 45 minutes or an hour, people are there to do the class and then go home. But I find in workshops where they are essentially fostering community within wherever you are, and again, it doesn't have to be pottery. It could be a tennis workshop where you're learning how to play tennis if you're into that then you're bound to be put into groups and meet people who not only live in your area, but are already interested in something that you're interested in. For example, last year, when I was really into tennis, I met a lot of people just on the tennis courts. We'd see each other every week, the same time at the tennis courts. And then we started hanging out and then we started bringing our friends and connecting. So I think it's so awkward to be like, hi, want to hang out? But I think that we do have to be willing to put ourselves out there to, to build community. And that kind of leads to the second point that you asked, which was the first question. Once you start to build that community, I think it's important to take inventory of how the people around you are making you feel. And for a lot of us, it won't be until we start to bring in new community and we start to experience what it feels like to feel more comfortable. Maybe you've been through therapy a bit. You've got boundaries. You've got a little bit of the healing language. You know who you should be saying yes to. You're not bringing in those red flags. And you notice that the people that maybe have been there for a while, you don't feel the same around them. You don't have that easeful feeling. I remember talking to someone in a workshop before where she said every time her phone rang and it was this friend, she would just literally feel nauseated about, she didn't know what was going to happen on the call. So many of us have people like that in our lives, especially family members that we don't feel like we can stop speaking to, or we don't want to cut ties with. And so I think it's important to just pay attention to how your body responds. Sometimes we'll lie to ourselves for a long time and it will ignore, but our body often cannot 
not respond to how we're feeling when we're uncomfortable. And I think sometimes that's the first acknowledgement of this isn't the person for me. This isn't the community for me. This isn't the relationship for me. And we can get curious about how we can choose ourselves and also be honest with the person that we're going to have to be honest with in a way that makes us feel comfortable, but also honors our truth. I think it's such a talked about thing right now in particular because of social media and because a lot of people are working remote or they move far away from their families. Like people are still living in big cities versus moving out to the suburbs because people can't afford housing. You know, there's just so many factors I think play into that happening, but it's also like you just got to step out there and do the dang thing, you know, because it's like we can talk about it and think about the best way to approach it. But it's in that stepping through fear interaction is where you're going to get the result. Absolutely. I have three really close friends right now, one of whom I met, this is wild, but through Peer Space, which oh. is an app that you use <laughs> to rent someone's facility or home for filming. And we connected through there and we've been friends for a few years now. So you know, be open. Obviously, I'm not all there are people I meet all the time where it's clear where there's not going to be a relationship. Not every single person I meet is going to be a connection. But being open to where those connections can be and being honest with yourself, do I actually have the space and time to build community? Because it's a lot of work. When you ha build these relationships, you have to now show up for the parties, show up for the events, show up for the phone calls. It doesn't have to be 16 new friends to have community. I think community can be the three of us, the two of us, finding community in the ways that you actually have space for and can show up for. Speaking of body language, you had an incredible TikTok that was basically like, here's your licensing to not be in those situations where you are essentially reading the other person's body language to see if they like you or if you said something wrong. And I feel like we've all been there where we're like, oh shit, they just did this or they're not paying attention anymore. Do they not like, what did I say? What should yeah. I do? And you start to contort yourself. How do you A, recognize that and B, how have you been able to transform not paying attention or taking it in or taking it personal or applying it to change anything about yourself? Oh my gosh, I think this is the hardest one because I'm a recovering perfectionist, people pleaser. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong? Why are you making this face? Why are you now on your phone? Whatever it is. I have just learned that really what people are doing is often not about me. Even if they think it's about me, it's often not about me. And if I know that I'm showing up and I'm listening and I'm doing the things, I'm not actually aggravating them in any way that I know about then I immediately remind myself, just be present and be yourself. I'm constantly advocating for myself to not perform. We perform in so many ways. It's such an energy drain. We show up and someone starts doing something. So all of a sudden we think, oh, let me do this. Let me do that. Let me just, what we're trying to do is change the atmosphere so that we are more comfortable. But what we can also do is learn to be in the discomfort or we can just excuse ourselves like, hey, is everything or we can ask, hey, is mm -hmm. everything OK? The energy shifted. We don't often want to address the elephant in the room and we just want to do whatever we can. And I know I learned that early on in my life. Let's just try to make this peaceful. Let's just try to keep this easy. I don't want to be the person that does anything wrong. Now I'm just like, no, I mean, I guess if you're uncomfortable, we're going to sit in this discomfort because I am not going to perform. And it's sucky. And I think it's also one of those things that leads back to what you asked earlier. If every time I'm around you, this is happening, maybe this isn't a fit. Because if you're uncomfortable every time you're around me, or I'm uncomfortable every time we're together, even if it's not me, I'm not showing up as my full self. This isn't feeling reciprocal. I'm now in a situation where I am limiting what this exchange can be because I don't know what's actually going on here. And so just being honest with ourselves. And I think it's also important to just mention that we don't always have to have a conversation with the other person. This is, doesn't always mean now we have to like have a long talk about what just happened. Sometimes it's just, I'm going to give you some space and see what kind of happens here. I think it's one of those tough things, but I think it's so important to acknowledge because it is performing in my opinion and it is keeping us from being honest about what's really happening because we're so caught up in the performance we don't realize that this isn't working 
And there's so much mind reading too. Like I'm always so curious of like, I have this assumption of why they may have done that. And it's always, oh, cause I did this, but it's never, oh, they just remembered that they had to do this at home. And now they're stressed out about all the tasks they have to do. And it has literally nothing to do with me, you know? And I think it goes back to how we relate to our parents and attunement there and how we relate to peers and things like that. But I mean, how many stories do we freaking tell ourselves that probably aren't even true. And here we are like contorting ourselves, being different, appeasing to someone's energy. I definitely am recovering and all of that as well. But it is really nice when those moments show up where you can make a choice, where you do have that pause, like, ooh, I could feed into the energy that I think this person wants from me, or I could just stay grounded and rooted. And if they don't receive it well, then okay, I can let this go. Absolutely. And I think the key thing that you said there is distinguishing or discerning between what's happening. I think that there's two things happening here. And one of the things you shared is really important. The first one is the person is going through something personally and you are picking up on their energy and maybe making it about you. And that's where we have to check ourselves and put those self boundaries in place. This actually isn't about me. I don't have to do anything about the way that they are feeling or their discomfort. And if I feel a way about it, I could ask them. The other one is when I'm with someone all the time and I don't feel comfortable and I don't even feel comfortable enough mentioning that I feel uncomfortable. Those are the ones where I think we perform a lot and where we start to get into our perfectionist, people-pleasing tendencies. But the other one is often because, yes, we're acting out of the situation where maybe we were growing up or maybe we were in a relationship where it wasn't safe to have feelings. And so feelings are coming up and now we're freaking out because we don't have the tools yet. And I I don't know about you because you said you're recovering from all the things too, but I just remind myself all the time, like I have the tools and I think it's important for people I teach. And whenever I, I talk to say, remind yourself, you have the tools to be able to deal with tough feelings, hard feelings, tough conversations when they come up and you will get through it. Nobody wants to have them, but you can do it. Every time they come up, you know, in, in the manifestation work we do, we call them like tests. They're really just like the opportunity to choose a new path, to choose a new way forward, to write a new story. And so it's like, oh, okay, this is a test. This is exciting because I get to like write a new path forward, get grounded, figure out what I'm going to do here and then take that leap. That's essentially what Wisdom of the Path is about. It's an invitation to readers to begin to ask themselves, how many times have I been on a journey where I had no idea what was going to happen? And just the thought of the change and just the discomfort of having to start something new was enough to make me not want to take another step forward. But how many times have I done this, arrived on the other side, and I look back and see that I am so much farther, so much better, so much stronger, so much braver than I would have ever been had I not taken those steps? And so even though those situations may be different, those experiences, those paths may be different, when we remind ourselves of the wisdom that we've gained and that we do have the intuition and discernment to continue to move forward and to do it with compassion, not judging and shaming ourselves along the way, because I know for myself, I would look back at my past and be like, I still can't believe you dated him. I still can't believe you took that job. You know, we, we have so many regrets that we carry. It's kind of hard to walk forward with regret because we are so afraid of making the wrong misstep in the future. So for a lot of us, we stay stagnant. But when we look back with compassion and with grace and we see somehow I arrived here anyway and I wouldn't necessarily change how I got here, I think it's just allowing ourselves to have a human experience without the perfection involved. And for a lot of us, I think that is the balm that we're looking for that we need to be able to be happy where we are in the present and to move forward. There's magnesium and then there's mellow. I love this little saying because I think so many times right now we're seeing magnesium in the evening. We need this for restful sleep. It's an incredible nutrient. You know, so many people are deficient. I think the statistic is 75% of people are deficient in this essential vitamin that impacts 300 different compounds in the body. And one of the reasons I am obsessed with Ned's Mellow Magnesium Super Blend is that not only is it some of the 
highest quality ingredients for magnesium. They have three forms of chelated magnesium, which means they are covering you from all angles on the magnesium. It's high bioavailability, clean ingredients, gluten-free, sugar-free, non-GMO, naturally derived. Not only all of that, but they also have L-theanine and GABA in there. And I say this because L-theanine is a supplement that is fantastic to use before bed to help induce relaxation, calmness in the body, and GABA helps support our brain health. So when we take GABA before bed or any time during the day, it is helping us create new neural pathways. And you know at TBM, we're always about creating new neural pathways of high self-worth, moving past those limiting beliefs. So just by taking the magnesium drink in the evening, you are supporting your neural pathways while you sleep. So what I like to do is take a little scoop of their magnesium powder. I'll drop it into, I put it in like a little cocktail glass and then swift it around. I'll put like a fancy ice cube in and make it the first part of my nightly ritual. And then maybe I'll go journal or I'll lay down and put on my red lights in the room. But this is kind of like the kickoff to my evening. It tastes fantastic. They have two new flavors, which I've been obsessed with recently. They're pomegranate and they're Meyer lemon. The Meyer lemon, let me know if you guys try it out, but the Meyer lemon to me tastes like a lemon pound cake, but not that sweet. I could be crazy, but that is my taste. It's just bringing back nostalgia of being a kid and having that at my grandma's. And it is absolutely delicious. And I keep both flavors on hand so I can switch off between the two. I also am obsessed with their lavender berry. That has been my original favorite that I've loved since day one of Ned, but their new flavors are also fantastic. So if you're interested in upping your sleep game, your nightly ritual, you're looking for something to help calm your nervous system before sleep, or also just help your neural pathways as you sleep, I highly, highly recommend Mellow Magnesium Super Blend. And we have a discount for you guys. You can get 15% off your order with TBM15. Again, that code is TBM15 for 15% off. Check out the link in the show notes to learn more about Ned, the incredible things that the company is doing and how clean and incredible their products are, how high quality it is truly fantastic. And I highly recommend it. You mentioned this in the book too, but this idea of we kind of look to other people's hard stories. We look to those pain points because we're looking for their hope. We're looking for that. Ooh, there's possibility there. Okay. If they got through it in this way. And if I look at my past, when I've done it, I got through it this way. People need that hope to get to the other side. I love the book because it, the way you break it down details, these really pivotal, hard moments where you either felt stuck or pushed up against a wall or felt like, oh my gosh, like, how am I ever going to get through this hurdle, this obstacle? And yet you took it step by step. And then all of a sudden you were transformed. And I think people are so afraid of that one step forward, or they feel so exhausted and burned out that they're like, okay, on top of everything else, I also have to change. (laughs) Like, how am I going (laughs) to do that? I kind of want to share a little bit, if you're open to it, about the $500 story. Because I think my jaw was like, oh my gosh, your integrity in that moment is unmatched. So the $500 story, this was a very pivotal time in my life because I was a single mom and, you know, just, just no other nice way to say it. I was broke. I was really struggling financially. I had moved into a neighborhood that was really wonderful for my daughter. And that was close to her old school, but my financial situation did not pan out the way that I was hoping it would. I was essentially working to be able to provide for her and have a roof over our heads and to keep her life exactly as it was when I was married to her dad, but I didn't have enough money for food for myself. So it was one of the most shameful things, and even to, to just talk about it now, because it's one thing when you write it in the book, and then when you start doing interviews and things, you have to talk about it. But now when I talk about it, it brings me so much. I'm so happy that I get to share it because I think a lot of people would resonate with this because I think there are a lot of people who have been in a position where they were experiencing food insecurity or weren't able to provide for themselves. This particular story, I was walking home the same way I walked home every day from the train. 
and I decided to cut through the cards. I still don't know why. I thought maybe it would get me there faster. I was running late. I knew I didn't want to get another late fee. I was late every single day picking her up about 15 minutes, but that 15 minutes was a $75 fee. It was wild. And as I'm walking through the parking lot, I literally remember seeing $500 on the ground. This is years ago. So it wasn't like I thought like I was on one of those like TikTok reels or something like that. Like (laughs) when you used to find money on the ground, it was actually something you could pick up (laughs) and put it in your pocket. It wasn't necessarily like a game or something. So I picked it up, but it was as if as soon as the money hit my hand, I knew it wasn't my money. I just knew. And I looked to my right. I remember the guy was standing like out of my vision there and he was like patting himself. His car was a mess. There were like papers hanging out of his car. And I'm like, this is this guy's money. He was an older man. And I had this like split decision. Like, do I just take the money? And before I could even like really think about the fact that I needed it, I was just walking to him and handing him the money. And he was like, oh my God, thank you so much. And I just remember thinking... I just felt like an idiot, to be honest. I was feeling like I gave away my blessing. You know, you talk about manifestation, things like that a lot. So at the time, what was really hot was the secret. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking I manifested this and I just gave it away. Like this was mine. And what I hope to bring by telling this story is first, that you're not alone if you're suffering, that there is another side of it that you can get through it. And I think the most important part that I mentioned in this story is because there's a lot more to it, but is that community is how you're able to get through it. My life didn't magically change after that. I didn't get home and it was like rom-com and someone was waiting there for me with a check. It was like, no, I got home and it was the same thing. There was no money there. There was no food there. And I finally got brave enough to tell someone how much I had been struggling. And without a question, they just sent me $500. Had that moment not happened where I had it dangled in front of me and I had to give it back, I would have never been brave enough to ask someone. And that was really the barrier to me. Just because I'm suffering, it doesn't mean I have to suffer alone. I don't have to go through this alone. And not everybody has someone that they can call and give them $500. $500 is a lot of money. And the person who gave it to me was also a single mom. I just also want to mention that she was also suffering. Like the $500 she gave me was like savings. So I just really think that Remembering that there are people who want to see you do well, who want to be there for you, who want to be in your corner. And you really never know where your blessing or your help can come from unless you open up and share what you're going through. I love this. And I'm so glad that you put this in the book because I think so many people at different parts of their life can resonate with that and especially resonate with the feeling of like, did I just fuck up my one shot? Was that my one chance at doing this thing or getting that opportunity or even when people leave like a job interview and they're like, oh my God, I said that thing. It was so stupid. This is my one shot. What did I do? And I feel like we can berate ourselves so much over that. And one thing we kind of say a lot in the manifestation realm of things is like, what is meant for you will not miss you. If your dream job, if that was it at that very specific company, they'll come back around. It'll work out. Or actually you might find something even more aligned that you don't know is out there. And the same thing with the $500. It's like, okay, no, it didn't come from that guy, which I did think it was weird that he didn't at least give you like one of the hundreds. I was like, come on, man, (laughs) you got to give something like, what are you doing? But that's his own journey. But it didn't miss you because it also allowed you to step into your vulnerability and share with community, which is a better gift than just even finding it on the ground. It's like I got to step into my power of being vulnerable and being honest about where I'm at and then be received and then gifted it after all. Absolutely. Because had I kept that $500, that was not enough to get me through whatever I was going through. I was just going to continue to do it alone and not tell anyone about it and just continue to push through. Having to ask and then now, actually, to be clear, I didn't ask, but having to tell her, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm struggling, which was essentially like me saying help. So it wasn't ask. I didn't clearly say, give me $500, but I was like, I, I don't know what to do. And her saying, dude, I'll send you $500. Pay me back when you can. And it took me like a year and a half to feel like I could actually send her that money because she told me, do not send me that money until you really can send me that money. We all need someone that we can be vulnerable with. I think this also leads back to the conversation of community. We think we need to have so many people. 
I had one, right? I had one person, maybe two people at the time, my sister as well, but I had one person that I could actually rely on to be that person for me. And that was enough. And so for a lot of us, when we think I only have two friends, I only have four friends. Like if you have two good friends, that is abundance. And sometimes when we look online and we see people partying with 15 people or doing different things, which is great, we get in this comparison mode. I talk about that in the book too. We get in this comparison mode of no one threw me a surprise party. So no one cares about me. No, I didn't wake up with roses filled in my living room. So I'm not really loved. Really look at your life and think if something happened, if I needed someone, if I wanted to go for a walk today with someone, which is abundance to me, do I have someone that I could call? I do. I think that is also community. I think that is also abundance. I think that is also in love. And I think we've become a society that doesn't value those things as much. And I don't think it's necessarily our fault. I think that just being on social media and being a voyeur all the time has really changed our perception. I hope that people are invited to really get curious about where abundance actually lies in their life or what is actually important to them so that when tough times come or when they are, are faced with experiences, hopefully not like mine, but we will all have tough times, that they feel comfortable letting people be there for them, that they feel comfortable being in their situation without comparing it to everything and everyone else, everyone is going through, that we don't even really know what they're going through because we don't even really know a lot of these people, and that we are honest with ourselves with compassion because the shame and the stories and the way that we tear ourselves up inside is often like more than half the battle at allowing people to really be there for us. And it's funny too, like we have this perception of people online and what their stories are by maybe what they share. And then when it turns out the dream celebrity couple is actually getting divorced and they weren't as happy as they appear, we're disappointed, but it doesn't change our distorted behavior and viewpoint of another couple. We're like, oh, that was them. Okay, but this one's happy for sure. It's like hard for us to catch up that maybe this isn't the dream life. And the dream life is in those little moments in our own life that has nothing to do with social media. Social media or celebrity, right? If you think about before social media, like it was celebrity, was what you see on TV, what you see on the news, what you see in magazines, essentially. And I used to love it. I'll be honest. Like I used to look, oh my God, did you see what happened? You see who's dating who and all of these things. And I think it just was a part of the culture. And I think about how much time and energy was absorbed into someone else's life. Like whether it's an influencer you're following, whether it's your neighbor that you don't know and you're just gossiping about. Like when we think about how much attention and time we put towards other things, I think it's another way. I, the only reason I'm talking about this is because it's a way that we can look at when we say we don't have time for ourselves. I don't have time for meditation. I don't have time for yoga. I don't have time to read a book. I don't have time to do whatever it is that you want to do. A lot of our attention and energy is being spent on things that we don't actually care about, that don't have value in our lives. And what would your life be like if you took just a little bit, just to start, a little less time thinking about what this person's going through that you don't know, that's not impacting you, and spending it on yourself. It's a tough transition. We're addicted, a lot of us, to scrolling and what we're watching and what it does to our brains. I get it. But we can reprogram. That's the beauty of being human. We can make different choices. And just getting a little curious about it is something that really starts. If you look at your screen time, look at how much time you spend on certain apps and think, when you say you don't have time for a 15-minute meditation, do you actually not have time for it? And not in a judgy way, more so like, oh, I do have time for a 15-minute meditation. Right now, I'm just spending my attention here. So how could I shift this? What would it look like to just start with two minutes? Because judgment is, is harsh and we really don't deserve any more harshness than what we already have to experience being adults today. I love that point. And I love that chapter in the book, too, about joy and those moments of joy. And we think joy is this thing that we get when we finish our task list and put the laundry away. We think joy is what we get when we can go on vacation that one time a year or when we can do all these external things sometime in the future. But actually, joy starts with appreciating right now. How did you start to incorporate that? And also, I mean, you kind of touched on it too, but like the getting honest with ourselves. I just went through a season where I felt 
so burnt out. And when I really looked at like, okay, what is burning me out? What are the things that my energy is going towards? It was like, I actually have time to take breaks. Why am I not taking the breaks? What am I choosing to do instead of taking the breaks? Why am I not doing that? And when I could start to make those choices over and over again, that's where I'm like, oh, it's not my workload, actually. It's that I'm not breaking between my workload. It's that I'm scrolling between my workload. It's that I'm filling the empty space with something else instead of having stillness. Yeah. So the joy journey for me definitely started when I started therapy, which was over, it was a long time ago. (laughs) I wanted to understand why other people were happy and I didn't feel that way. And I did not understand what it could feel like to be happy. The first problem was I thought that happiness was something I would experience all day, which is just not. We have a myriad of emotions and we're going to have different experiences throughout the day. And that is completely fine. So that was like the first step. And then the second step was for me, the comparison. I looked at other people's lives and I thought my life is not fulfilled until I have these kinds of shoes, this kind of bag. I can go on this type of vacation. My boyfriend or my husband or whoever does this for me specifically. This is what love looks like. I had to start to redefine what actually made me happy. Yes, I love being on vacation, but when I go for a walk in my neighborhood, I am just as fulfilled as when I go on a walk when I'm on vacation. When I am in a hotel, I always, I have a ritual where I watch Charmed. It is my favorite thing in the world to do. (laughs) But I was like, why am I not watching Charmed at home? The things that you enjoy to do when you're out in the world and you say, this is, I'm never happier than I was in this moment. Why can't you find time for that in your day? I was talking to someone recently at a speaking engagement. And I said, even if it's on your lunch break, even if on your lunch break, you're watching the show that you love or you're doing whatever it is that brings you joy in that moment, you're taking your walk, you're watching your Charmed, you're whatever. That also counts. So this really got serious for me during COVID where it was like, I have to choose joy because I refuse to lose myself completely in this moment of when we are already dealing with so much. So that's when I started to create the joy list where I have on my phone, I keep a list of things that actually bring me joy that don't require me to go to the store and get something like a yogurt parfait brings me joy. Right. But that's not on my joy list because I don't always have berries and I don't always have yogurt. So if I looked in my fridge and saw that I didn't have those, then I would start to be pissed about the fact that I don't have either of those things. So things like that don't put on your joy list. You want to put things like watercolor. If you know you already have it in your house or FaceTiming a friend, Although being on your phone can be something that's maybe not contributing to a healthy form of joy all the time, FaceTiming is great. Texting with someone. So you create a list from that. And my rule is always start with five minutes. Because if you start with five minutes, you're more likely to go longer. But if you start with, I'm going to do an hour long walk, most likely you're not going to make it if this is the first thing that you're starting with. But I think that for a lot of people, just to be concise and like really drive it home, Joy is something that we can access every day, but I just also want to be honest to your point about burnout. It's not always something that feels accessible in certain periods of our life. And I think it's okay to allow yourself, like, I think sometimes we judge ourselves and we say, am I really doing this right? Like, am I really in a place of, am I okay? Because I'm not experiencing joy right now and I'm feeling burnt out. And sometimes life happens to us. So for example, I'm going through situations in my house and my life and with my kids right now that are very overwhelming and are making me feel a little burned out. And with all the tools that I have, I'm still a human and I'm still going to have normal emotional responses to being overwhelmed by things. So I don't want people to think, oh my gosh, maybe I'm not doing enough joy exercises or maybe I'm not doing enough meditation or maybe I need to double up on therapy. Like maybe those things are true. And also maybe life sucks right now. Life is hard right now and things are overwhelming right now or things are just really tough. And I think that's also okay because we get so scared. I do believe joy is our birthright. I do believe we have access to it, but I think we also get caught in the healing loop of, Am I about to lose everything I worked for? You might. Grief might make you lose it. Overwhelm might make you lose it. Something changing drastically that you didn't expect might make you lose it for a little while. But it's your birthright, meaning you can always gain access to it again when you're ready. And I think that's the work for us. I love that 
permission slip. That is so needed. And that's something my therapist has been like trying to hammer into me. I'm like, I, oh, I was in burnout because of this. And this is what I got to do to never go back to it again. And she goes, you just had a really stressful season. Like you got a new puppy. There was a lot of family stuff going on. There was a lot of emotional things happening. It made sense that you were burnt out. Let's acknowledge that life does happen. And that even if we have all the tools and all the things, there's going to be ups and downs of life. That's just how life is being a human. And so instead of being mad that we're in this cycle again, are there ways that we could nourish ourselves? Can we have that toolkit of, oh, I'm in this phase again. There's a big life thing happening. I'm feeling that burnout. What can I do to try to support myself during that season? And how can I be gentle with myself in this season? Like, why am I rushing myself? It's kind of like when you see women that have babies and they're trying to bounce back six weeks after giving birth. Some people do bounce back right away, I guess. I haven't met anyone who actually feels like their self before they got pregnant six weeks after. So I'm just starting to feel like myself and my youngest is, is going to be six next month. So it just all depends on the pregnant, the different pregnancies. But I'm just using that as an example. If you're someone who doesn't want to have kids or you're someone that if you're not a woman or you know that you're just not interested in that, just thinking about that perspective, I would give that person permission to not feel like themselves again because they went through something really hard, their body changed, their life changed, and now they have something new. Why won't we do that for ourselves? I just went through something really hard. My life just changed. Even if you didn't physically change grief, my body just changed. I just lost something. There's grief in positive things. I just got the job I wanted and now I know my life will never be the same again because of my time commitments or my travel. There's grief in losing that. There's grief in marriage. The single part of me, who I used to be, I don't have time for my friends as much anymore. I have to share holidays with my spouse now. Like there's grief in positive things too. And so if our life goes through a change, if our body goes through a change, if our relationships go through a change, why don't we give ourselves time to adjust? And I think there's a lot of us are missing grace. I don't think we're taught having grace for ourselves. I think we're taught to just get on with it, to just move on with it, to stop complaining. I talk about this in my first book, The Sugar Jar. Constructive complaining is healing. Finding space and time to just talk about what you cannot stand right now is where you will find your truth. Because when we act like everything's okay, we get caught in this toxic positivity loop with ourselves and we're just trying to gratitude our way through life. And yes, gratitude in all things. And also we have to be honest with ourselves so that we can make changes when things aren't working. So when we have this conversation about joy, it's always going to be about also being honest. It's always going to be about also being compassionate with ourselves. It's always going to be about extending grace because I don't think joy can really exist in a healthy way without those other things present. By now, you're starting to get the feel for TBM. Maybe you've heard about our workshops and you're interested in manifestation, but you just don't have the time or energy to sit down and do self-help work. We totally get it. In fact, that's why we created the Daily Practice, which is our massive library of self-hypnosis tracks that you can do anytime without having to jump into a workshop. We call these tracks our Deep Imaginings, or DIs. DIs are different than normal meditations because we designed them using a combination of self-hypnosis techniques, deep theta waves, EMDR informed tools, and somatic experiencing. A fully loaded formula that is scientifically proven to help you clear your blocks and triggers on a subconscious level, giving you the power to actually create new neural pathways in your brain. So if your boss pisses you off, use our trigger DI. If you want to feel magnetic before a party or an important meeting, use the magnetic self DI. If you're feeling anxious or down on yourself or you need help making a decision, we've got a DI for all of these scenarios and more. You can get full access to the daily practice inside the Pathway membership, where you'll also get unlimited access to every workshop, tool, and offering from TBM. The tools in the Pathway membership will support you year round, whether you're in the worst, a rock bottom, or second worst, a rut, or feeling good and you want to keep the magnetism going. In the Pathway, you'll effectively learn how to become your own manifestation coach, all for less than a dollar a day. 
So even if you're not ready to start a workshop, join the pathway and start rewriting your neural pathways now to create magnetism. Work through your triggers and get closer to your authentic magnetic self in order to manifest. And our big summer sale, which you can lock in the lowest prices of the season, is available until July 16th at midnight PST. So be sure to join before then so you can take advantage of the lowest prices of the season. You won't see a sale from us for a while. Now back to the episode. I love that you said to the grief and the positive things, because I think we are so wired for the next, the next, the next. We get the big manifestation, we get the big thing, but we're not actually processing what that change looks like, what that transformation looks like. You mentioned the women that run with the wolves in the book a lot. I love, love that I book. I love it's that book. so good. She does a really good job of mentioning these cycles, these transformational cycles. People love the coming of age stories of like kids going from teenagers to adult or going from tween to teens or these chapters in our life. But it seems like, okay, then you get married, then you have kids, and then there's no more transformational periods. And it's like, there's a ton of them. And so let's start honoring those moments. Let's take pause of those moments. Let's reflect and actually integrate them. There isn't a lot of invitation to do that in that. It's like, no, just celebrate. You got the good thing on to the next. It's like, well, let's sit in all that this means for this next chapter. Oh my goodness. I think that that's like my work this season. When Clarissa Pinkola says the author of Women Who Run With Wolves talks about the doors, it just gives me chills. Essentially, if you haven't read the book, first of all, go read it. Get mine and get hers. (laughs) But when you think about the doors, she talks about Anytime something happens in your life, it's an opening for you. It's an opportunity for you to walk through a new door and learn something new about yourself. I think that's such a freeing perspective when you see something happen in your life to think, what is this possibly teaching me versus why is this happening to me? Why have I been chosen for this? And it's a human response to feel attacked when hard things are happening. But even in the positive, which is what you were talking about just now, When we get what we asked for, it's often very shocking how hard it is to cope with having what we asked for. It's not as easy as you would think when you come into the thing that you finally manifested into reality and you have the job or the business or that you reached the goal on your social media, whatever it is you're you're trying to do. It's like, oh, wow, this also comes with more responsibility, more accountability, more of my energy being attuned to this, then I I didn't even know I had this capacity. And sometimes it happens before we even attune to getting comfortable with it. And so I think looking at those opportunities as doors and allowing it to be an experience rather than judging ourselves rubrically, like grading ourselves with how well we're doing, it's freeing, especially for women, because we are judged in every way. And I think that's why we naturally grade and judge ourselves because we're judged from the moment that we're like five years old, how good you are, how pretty you are, how cute you are, how long your hair is, your skin tone, your this, your that, your shape. And so allowing these things to be doors, allowing these opportunities, when I hear my inner critic, I talked about it today, come up, I say, how is this an invitation for me to love myself more? How is this a door for me to walk through loving myself more, being more compassionate towards myself, perhaps being more vulnerable, perhaps showing up in a way that I didn't before? Because sometimes my inner critic comes up and I believe it and I have to remember who the F I am. So I think that's what the opportunity of the door is to remember who you are and to really be grounded in the fact that even though everything may be really bumpy right now, I'm still who I am. I'm still firmly planted and I will still arrive on the other side. I love that. I shared that with my fiance because this week in particular, we've been kind of yo-yoing where like one day one of us is our inner critic is super harsh and the other one is like, no, don't listen to it. You got it. And then the next day it's like, damn, my inner critics got me today and we have to kind of lift each other every other day. But I think that's so powerful to say, okay, In this moment, I'm believing my inner critic and it doesn't make it true. And there will probably be another moment where I don't believe this inner critic. 
it's not speaking based on facts. It's speaking based on fears. It's speaking based on shame. It's speaking based on guilt. It's speaking based on societal standards that we're not even really measuring ourselves against, but we feel like we have to attribute to or align with in order to fit in. And so when we remember that when our inner critic says, who do you think you are? You don't have enough experience. That's never going to happen for you. You need to slow it down. You're thinking too big. You're taking up too much space. What is the actual truth? What is the actual evidence that any of these things are true? And I, I call it fact checking. I fact check myself all the time. Is there any evidence that right now, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but like you could be talking with a friend and you think, am I taking up too much space? Or even in this interview, I could be like, my inner critic could come out and be like, wow, will you just stop talking for a minute? That's how our inner critic kind of shows up. Yes, yes. And then you have to remind yourself, actually, I'm being interviewed. I think it's okay. <laughs> or she asked me how I was doing. I think I'm allowed to answer. Like sometimes we have to fact check ourselves and remind ourselves, so that next time when it comes up, maybe we have that muscle memory a little bit quicker and it goes away and dissipates. And we, we were, we're training ourselves to, to be kind to ourselves. And it sucks that that's the process of adulting. But I'm hopeful that as future generations come around, maybe we'll begin to teach that younger. I know I'm doing that with my kids. And so that hopefully they already have that voice instilled in them when they're in a critic, inevitably rears his ugly head inside them. I, I am so hopeful for future generations because of that, because so many people are on the healing journey now than ever before, it seems. And even just having that acknowledgement, I could think now back to childhood, the moments where my mom's inner critic came up or my dad's inner critic came up and it came out of them as fact. And so as a kid, you absorb that and you're like, oh, that's fact. OK, got it. Instead, if they had the tools or they knew, oh, this is just this fear part coming up. I don't need to verbalize it. And I'm certainly not going to verbalize it in front of my kids. Then maybe the kids wouldn't take that on. You know, like it's just yeah. that continued cycle that I'm really hopeful for future generations. Me too. And I just want to say quickly on that, which I also talk about in the book. I think that they are sharing their inner critic as a way to protect us. They're hoping that they can keep us from experiencing whatever gave them that inner critic in the first place. They're trying to prevent us. Hey, it's not going to happen for you because it didn't happen for them. And when we see that, not only will we understand why they did it, we get to have some empathy for them, but then we also get to have empathy for ourselves when we inadvertently do it as well. Because I know I've, I've done it before trying to save someone from something that really wasn't my responsibility to save them from. It's funny with my partner recently, he had... He tries out different fashion things all the time. And some of them I'm like, I don't know if that one worked, but that's my inner critic. Even thinking, yeah. I don't know if that one, who the heck am I to judge? I'm not a right. fashionista by any means. I'm just going off of what I see in society or what I see online. And I think what it is, is I want to protect him from someone else having the same reaction that I did. That's exactly it. Yes. It's so wild when you really start to look at it, the way that we say things and we think, I'm saying this from a kind place to, to help you and to protect you. But we have to say inside kindly, but like, who asked you? Like, I have to ask my son now. <laughs> like, Yasmin, who asked? I think that's why we see so many little kids dressed however they want today, which would have never happened when I was growing up. You have to be like matching and looking a certain way. And now we're just letting our kids flow. And it's very interesting to see how this is manifesting in families and relationships and in community as a whole. Talking about having family and having a business and all these things, but then having that time with yourself. Talk about the Elton John trip oh a little my bit. God, I'm like putting this on my manifestation list, not for Elton because I know he's not performing anymore, but the trip. I was the like, trip. yes, I have to do this. It was just amazing. Last year, I went on my first solo trip it started because I wanted to see Elton John. I've wanted to see Elton John since I was like 16 years old. I've just loved him since the moment I heard his voice. And nobody wanted to go with me. I mean, I obviously, we're not, I'm not the Elton John generation. I think there's that. <laughs> My husband didn't want to go. And I really wanted to go with someone who was excited. So I put it off. And this last tour was his goodbye tour, meaning he wasn't going to be touring anymore. So I just decided, you know what? I'm going to buy a ticket. And I decided to go in England because I thought, why not see Elton in England? And then I decided to make it like an 11 day solo trip. So I will preface this with saying I understand that that I'm privileged to be able to take an 11 day solo trip. I understand a lot of people may not be able to do that. I also just want to say that I saved up 
for this trip. So I'm only sharing that to say that it took me prioritizing something that was really important to me to be able to go and have the trip the way that I wanted to have it. The point of the solo trip was to really explore what it was like to prioritize myself and spend time with myself with no expectations. There was no work. There was no kid event, nothing. And before I took off, I was scared. I actually called a few friends. I talk about this in the book. And I was like, hey, is there any way you can fly out with me if just for a couple of days? Like, I'm so afraid of landing not only on a solo trip, but in another country by myself. I'd been before, but I'd been with my husband. It was the best thing that I'd ever done. Waking up, having time all to myself. The other thing that was really great because I was in a different time zone, there was no keeping in touch. Like it was really just my time. And I think if you for sure are a mom listening, but for anyone listening that feels like it's maybe hard to take time for yourself, maybe just starting with one day in your area, like a weekend trip or whatever, and just seeing what it does. It doesn't have to even, you don't even have to spend the night. Just take the day and go be a tourist in your own area. The connection, the community, the meeting random people at bars because I was eating alone and talking to them about their lives and then sending them off, never seeing them again. It was all just, it was just magical for lack of a better term. It's so interesting because I feel like I've heard a lot of people talk about like how important it is to take solo trips and blah, blah, blah. But actually reading you talk about the steps it took for you to get there and that process and even like what it was like landing, what it was like taking the trains, like hearing those details was the exact expansion I needed to be like, okay, I got to do it. You know, it just like hit differently reading your story about it. So thank you for being my expander in that. (laughs) I'm so happy to hear that. And I hope that a lot of people feel invited to do it. People who take solo trips are regarded as selfish, especially if you don't have travel. Like I I know a lot of people say, oh, I travel all the time. But if it's for work, you're working. I had traveled a ton too. I was in the Air Force before I did what I did. So I traveled a ton, but never did I just travel to go to a concert. It felt really luxurious and it was, and but also I think we get to define what luxury means to us. That's not something I'm going to be doing every single year. Like that was a, like a, a trip that I took and just giving yourself the space to create that for yourself. I think it's, I think it's freeing because we're always thinking about other people. I know for myself, I'm always thinking about how I can do things for other people, be there for other people. When I look back at my life and I hope that my kids see it, I hope that they feel like I can do what I want for me too. I saw my mom also living her life and taking care of us, being at PTA meeting and doing work, being at the events and going on a solo trip. I really want my girls to feel like I can have an identity outside of wife, mother, career person. Like I could just be me too. And I think that's important. So where can people find you, connect with you, get the book? I'm telling you guys, if you are going through a hard time or even if you just need inspiration for a good time, like it has all of these incredible stories, every tough moment, how she persevered, exercises for it. Like it's such a good expander book. I just want to like really instill that with our audience. It's incredible. You have to check it out and read it for sure. Thank you so much. So the book is called Wisdom of the Path. It's sold everywhere books are sold. Indie bookstores, Amazon, Target, Barnes & Noble, all the places. You can find me on Instagram at Yasmin Cheyenne. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. So excited for what's to come and the next journeys on your path and just keep following along. And I really appreciate all of your wisdom you shared with us today. You too. Thank you. Okay, here's our expander story for the week and we'll see you guys next time. Hi, this is Jeanette. This is my third summer challenge that I have participated in with To Be Magnetic, and I have been able to manifest many things, including aligned relationships, an amazing job that was the result of the winter 2022 challenge. And as I'm in my 40s, I'm less interested in manifesting things, and I use the work more for the healing properties. I am a completely different person than I was even three years ago. I know that I'm the most highest, authentic, truest, healed, happiest version of myself that I have ever been. 
So this summer, I am focusing on manifesting pings that show me more archaic beliefs that are occupying space for better things that I need to let go of. So last year, my primary focus was healing the generational trauma that came from my father who survived the Nazi occupation of his country and a subsequent traumatic immigration and a brand new life. I do need to say that I love my father more than air and he was my favorite person on planet earth. He passed away when I was 18 and I have just felt that vacancy in that hole ever since then. I feel like last summer I had pretty much accomplished a lot of that generational trauma and a lot of that healing surrounding that wounding only to receive the ping this week that hero worship can occupy space as easily as generational trauma can. And just because something seems positive, it can still prevent us from manifesting the life we want. So this week, I am now working through separating my energy from my father's and understanding that I can love and I can honor and revere and cherish all that my father was and all that his survival and immigration brought about while also creating my own identity that is separate from his. Realizing that the good things that he brought forth are his good things and he will always be remembered and honored for those. And it's not my responsibility to hold that as a torch, so to speak, and carry that on for future generations. He did his work and now it's my time to do my work. So currently I am relearning once again in my 40s how I get to be the newest, better version of myself, thanks to TBM.